the class, and welcome to Literature of the Middle Ages and Renaissance. I decided to try something a little new this week, and I am recording a version of the lecture in addition to the written out one. So I hope you enjoy. Of course, you still have the written lecture that you can use. You can read and it's searchable. You can do control F to find terms. So that's kind of nice. But sometimes it's fun just to listen and watch a lecture. So here we go. Uh, so let's start off with the old ages. All right. The old ages in England um, ranged from about the second half of the first millennium AD. In other words, around 500 to 700 AD. Um, till the beginnings of the second millennium, which is around the 1100s. So there's about a, you know, 600 to 400 uh, year span, you know, maybe, or maybe five to 600. So from 500 AD about to around the 1100s AD. So that's a very long time ago. It was over a thousand years ago. The English language then was largely a Germanic language, actually, based on the Anglo-Saxon dialects of invading Angles, Saxons, and Jutes. So those tribes came from an area that we now would call Denmark, over there in that area. Um, and literally the name Angle, which supplies our name for the English language, it comes directly from Angle, um, it was because the land jetted out into like an angle. And that's also where the Jute name came from, because it was from Jutland or Yetland. So it was like like a J almost kind of angling out into the water um, between England and Denmark. And so that's where we got the name Angle. They invaded England, and that Angle tribe gave its name to the language that it brought over. Um, which eventually morphed into what we call English nowadays. But back then, it was highly Germanic. And, and our language still has a Germanic, Germanic base because um, it's based on that language of the Angles, Saxons, and Jutes. So in other words, its grammar really is, is fundamentally Germanic or based like a German language. And a lot of root words in some of the very basic vocabulary still retain those Germanic roots. Since then, of course, William the Conqueror, he conquered in 1066, so that's why kind of the Old English period ended about then. Um, and he, he was from France. Normandy was where he came from over in France. It was the northern province that was just across the English Channel from England. And he brought his troops over, conquered England, and then really French became the language of the court for the next about three to 400 years in England. And that's where we get a lot of our French or Latin based roots in the English. Um, so because French was based on Latin, you know, it had evolved from Latin. So it retained a lot of those Latin root words, which morphed into French. And so that's why English is such a conglomeration of different languages. We have this Germanic base, you know, with French, roots overlaid on top of those Germanic roots and Germanic grammar. Um, so that's why you're like, what the heck? Why, why do we have so many synonyms? And it's because we have different languages feeding into what we eventually have as English. And um, you, you think, why do we have crazy spellings? Well, again, that's because we have so many different uh, languages feeding into um, English. We're, we're like the melting pot of languages, right? So to speak. All right. So anyway, um, those dialects of the Anglo-Saxons um, who invaded, uh, they have some of those old Norse roots that the, um, the again, also from the Vikings, uh, they brought those over to into England. Um, so it's from that same area and they, that old Norse Germanic language is, is what they brought with them. All right, an example of how old English sounds is found, actually I put in a YouTube video into the, um, lecture. Um, and this is a man performing the opening lines of Beowulf, which is the most famous Anglo-Saxon epic. Okay. Uh, it was written in the early 700s in England. All right. So let's listen to this. Thank you. 
All right, that was bold English. What was neat with that video is it also had it written out so you could see the spellings, um, or at least the transliterated spellings. Anyway, um, so these might have been written in runes. No, actually, I'm not quite. Old English did use runes, but then at some point we have this this written out form, and it's interesting because you can see maybe a few of the words that like have come into uh, our modern language that have evolved from these old English words, and the sound you know was was kind of neat, right? Because it's it's quite different from how we would pronounce now, but you can hear a little bit of our English sound coming out, right? But it's it's just like the vowels are kind of shifted a little bit. And that happens over time, right? Because we didn't have what we have nowadays with modern technology to preserve sounds and spellings and things like that. So without that as a constant check to, to keep things in line, things morphed over time back then. Uh, all right, well, that, that was kind of fun to hear that. I, I love to hear um, kind of that historical, uh, really neat old English sound there. All right, how do we possibly know how old English sounds, you may ask, right? How, how does he know how to pronounce that? Well, scholars base such pronunciations on a variety of factors, including rhyme, rhythm, pronunciations of languages still closely related to Old English, and also written primers. So they would write how things were pronounced. And if you examine rhyme, you can hear, oh, this word rhymes with that word. Therefore, they must be pronounced the same. So you can sometimes extrapolate pronunciation from that. All right, how many old English female writers will we be studying? Good question, right? Actually, zero. Zero, there are zero old English writers that are female. Um, so we're not studying any female writings from the Old English period because there are not any recorded. Of course, this does not mean that there were no Old English women composing, right? Because there could have been. What it means is that we just don't have any that have the a female name attached to it. We have um, Beowulf, that composition, which is actually, uh, you know, it's, I, as I told you, it's in Old English. Um, and it's actually anonymous. There's no author attached to it, as are a lot of the Old English compositions. They don't have often writers attached to them. There are a few, like the Venerable Bede, um, but most of them are anonymous, and there are no women whose names are attached to any Old English compositions. So, um, we can't start with the Old English composition for women. Uh, literary works were usually composed to help people preserve and pass on their history and mythological and religious views. While at the same time, these compositions also serve the important function of providing both instruction and entertainment to the people of the time. So that's what they did back in the Old English times. A lot of these compositions started off as spoken compositions, all right? And so they have a lot of like rhyme and rhythm and alliteration and commonly used phrases that are repeated over and over again. Kind of like when we begin fairy tales with like um, similar phrases like once upon a time, you know, and then we end them with similar phrases like, ah, and they lived happily ever after. Well, those kinds of stock phrases were used often in oral compositions because for an oral composition to be shared, it had to be memorized or, or you know, at least remembered fairly accurately and then repeated to people. So people would sing these or speak them and it would be like entertainment. It'd be like what we did when we turned on the television. All right. But instead they would have these balladeers sing them and it would preserve history or great battles um, that people would love to hear about, you know, over and over again. Um, it also would sometimes have religious instruction or everyday history. So that's what the pretty much the purpose was of these compositions during the Old English period. It was to teach people about history and religion and also entertain people. So I use this word composition here because during the Old English period, most compositions were sung songs, ballads, and sung poems. The culture was extremely oral because the lack of the lack of readily available writing implements. You know, we didn't have paper, writing papers and pens that were available to people. Um, these were, you know, you had to be fairly wealthy or belong to the church, you know, be like a, a, a priest or someone who had access to recording devices like pen, or not a pen, but you know, a quill and ink 
and some sort of um, paper to write on, like a palimpsest. Therefore, people infuse their works with conventions, as I talked about, um, the rhyme, rhythm, repetition of sound and word, and even stock phrases. Um, while no compositions of the Old English time period have been definitively attributed to a female writer, scholars speculate that some compositions may have been written by women, as potentially evident in The Wife's Lament. So this is a composition called The Wife's Lament. So you think, oh, well, maybe a woman wrote it because it's about a wife lamenting something. And the phrase goes, I make this song sadly about myself, about my life. I, a woman, say, I've been unhappy since I grew up. So the the subject matter of the verse entails a woman who, coincidentally or not, is lamenting, sad and unhappy since she grew up. So, so our anthology theorizes that this unhappy state of woman in this song may extend to many women of the time period and so reveal the almost strangling life conditions of women. Women were confined to the home and they were consumed by the daily tasks of the home, including child rearing, housework, cooking, sewing, etc. And they were not educated and were actively discouraged from reading and writing, writing, even forbidden. During the Middle Ages, in fact, reading and writing could mark a woman as a witch, believe it or not. Yeah, so you could imagine that the wife would be lamenting here. So that's why, you know, the anthology speculates that maybe that wife's lament was actually written by a woman. But it's a not, it's, there's no name attached to it, so we, we can only speculate. But it you know, it would seem odd that a man might write about the side, sad life of a woman, right? Because in the men's opinion, that was what women were supposed to be doing. So that would be a good thing if a woman were doing that. So you'd have to have either a highly empathetic man writing that composition or perhaps a woman. So during the old ages, scripture and cultural strictures prohibited women from straying beyond their subordinate place next to Adam. Adam, you know, as in Adam and Eve. Um, the biblical story. So um, women were considered um, during the old ages period to be subordinate next to Adam and under man in the great chain of being. So the great chain of being was this um, concept that was common in England in these days where there's this great chain of be being. Imagine like these links in a chain and the chain starting at the top and going down. And at the very top would have been like God and underneath God would have been like the king or the feudal lord, you know, so the king at the top, if there were a king, a central king. Um, back in the old old English time period, a lot of times there were, there was a king actually, but not um, what we consider as like the kings of England. They were kings of different areas, but then there was a centralized king. Um, so they're, they're considered like the pre-kings of England. Um, so that king would be below God. And then you'd have the feudal lords, you know, and the rest of the nobility. And underneath the nobility would come, um, well, you'd have clergy and nobility. And underneath them would be the everyday people. So they were considered much lower down on that great chain of being. Um, and women were considered beneath men. So um, it was all on this chain, this hierarchy of who is important and who has power. Uh, so women were put, you know, towards the bottom. And children underneath that even. All right, so this association with Eve um, is often associated to to women in general and considered them as evil um, versus righteous. It was interesting because Adam and Eve both partook of the tree, but Eve is viewed as evil and 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 as the temptress, and Adam is views, viewed viewed. Um, as having sinned, but as being a, more associated with righteousness. Um, so Eve is, is, is considered condemned versus being redeemed, you know, as Adam would be con con viewed as, as the, as the redeemed figure. She's the tempter. He's the saint. Um, women are vulnerable versus men who are considered strong. 